Hello, my name is Andreas Asion and the topic of this tutorial is Carrier Envelope Phase Stabilization, the CEP4. 4 stands for the fourth generation of CEP stabilization technique. The CEP4 based on the feed-forward technique developed in the Max Born Institute in cooperation with femtolasers. And before I proceed with that tutorial here, I would like to introduce the carrier envelope phase term. So, the electric field of an ultra short laser pulse equals the temporal amplitude function times the cosine of the carrier frequency times t minus f time-dependent phase function plus an offset phase. And actually this offset phase, this is the carrier envelope phase. For the sake of simplicity, we set the time-dependent phase to zero because we are discussing only bandwidth limited pulses in that tutorial. So when I started my career in the laser business, now, actually, this is some time ago. We didn't care about carrier envelope phase. We didn't even know that this is of some relevance. And the reason for that is quite simple. At that time, intense laser pulses you can get with around 90 femtoseconds or 100 femtoseconds. When we consider, for example, a 100 femtosecond laser pulse here, then that's the amplitude function. The carrier frequency is of the order of a few radians per femtoseconds, which means the, a full oscillation of the carrier is proportional to a femtosecond. So when we consider that pulse form, the envelope function is over more than 50 cycles and it doesn't matter what kind of carrier envelope phase we have, it always looks the same. In contrary, when the envelope phase function is quite short here, of a femtosecond time scale, we will see that the electric field changes drastically when the carrier envelope phase changes. So let's assume the intensity of these pulses is high enough to ionize the sample. Then the quasi-free electron will be accelerated in the electric field. And you can see that with this parameter, carrier envelope phase, we can control the micromotion of the electrons. And this is actually the trick what you're using well, when you're doing high harmonic generation and when you would like to uh, generate single attosecond pulses. So the next question is, where is this phase coming from when we are talking about a real oscillator? So we are looking into a mode-locked oscillator cavity. So here is a simple schematic. We have here an end mirror, the output coupler, the gain medium, which is pumped by a CW source, and a dispersion control. The dispersion control compensates the pos positive dispersion introduced by the gain media. And when the settings are well done, the oscillator starts to mode lock. What happens then is that the pulse is propagating back and forth. If we would place a photodiode here, then whenever the pulse is coming to the output coupler, part of it is transmitted and we would see this regular series of pulses, the pulse train. The difference of the pulses is given by one round trip time when this is the length of the cavity, the round trip time 
is given by 1 over the group velocity times the length of the cavity. And what you, <coughs> when we would have the opportunity to zoom in to these pulses, we would see, yeah, we would see the electric field. And we would recognize that the electric field of this series of pulses is not equal. It changes. And the change between two agendered pulses is actually the face slip. This is the carrier envelope phase accumulated by one round trip due to dispersion in the cavity. So the question now is, what is the physical mechanism which generates that phase slip in the oscillator? In order to clarify that question, we have this schematic here. So this gray area here symbolizes the dispersion the pulse acquires during one round trip. Dispersion means the refraction index, the first derivative of the refraction index is unequal to zero. This is equivalent to the fact that the group velocity is unequal to the phase velocity. So the, again, the electric field of the laser pulse equals the temporal amplitude function times the cosine of the carrier times t minus the carrier envelope offset at phase. So we can simply say this is a product amplitude times carrier. The amplitude propagates with the group velocity. The carrier propagates with the phase velocity. These velocities are different, so therefore there will be a time difference after this burst of media. Then you will see that this temporal shift reflects in a phase shift here compared to that. So when we then multiply the carrier with the envelope again, we will see a different electric field. So the phase shift can be calculated. It's given by the carrier frequency times 1 over the phase velocity minus 1 over the group velocity times L. This is the length of the dispersive media. And this equals 2 pi, the first derivative of the diffraction index, times L. OK, so we have a phase slip. Let's come back to the pulse strain. What does this mean? OK, here on top, you can see our pulse strain. The difference between each pulse is, is the round trip time, and a phase slip is, is accumulated in between two pulses. We have here a regular series of pulses. The amplitude function is the same, and we have, when we have here the nth pulse, we know the phase here is given by the original offset phase n times the phase slip. So this regularity here is reflected in a frequency comp. The spacing of the frequency comp here is just the repetition rate, which is proportional to 1 over the repetition rate. The carrier frequency of this pulse is given by the repetition rate times n. n is a huge number, around 1 million. And the consequence of the phase slip is seen here. There is an offset here, and this offset is the carrier envelope offset frequency. So all the frequency components the comp consists of have this additional frequency contribution, so therefore we have to add this up here. And the carrier envelope frequency is given by 1 over 2 pi times the phase slip times the repetition rate. So when the repetition rate is on a radio frequency range, the carrier envelope frequency is also on a radio frequency range. Next question is, is the phase slip constant over time? Actually, that is not true, and therefore we need the carrier envelope phase stabilization scheme. 
So how does this scheme look like? Okay, we know the change of the intracavity dispersion changes the face slip. So what we can do is to insert wedges in order to change the internal dispersion of the cavity by just moving them in and out, but this is a slow mechanism. A fast mechanism is given by the non-linearities in the cavity. The intracavity power is quite high. So therefore, we have non-linear phenomena. For example, the refraction index of the gain meter has a non-linear component. This is the non-linear refraction index and two times the intensity. So if we change the intracavity power, by, for example, by changing the pump power, refraction index changes and this can be done very fast. So we have a slow and a fast knob. And we know the carrier envelope frequency is a radio frequency, so we have all the devices we need for amplification, filtering and so on. The only thing left is how to measure the carrier envelope offset frequency and this is done with the so-called F to 2F interferometer. Here, this is the photodiode, and this photodiode gives us the FCE signal. This signal is filtered and amplified, and what we need else is a reference frequency, F reference. So when the <coughs> with the wedges, we are, we are changing the face slip and therefore the FCE and bring that close to the reference frequency. When they are close together, we are closing the loop and the phase detector measures the phase difference. And the phase difference is then the error signal for the PI controller. And the PI controller changes the pump laser power, intracavity power is changed, phase slip is then changed. And so therefore we can keep the carrier envelope offset frequency constant. But there is a big but, because the speed of control is limited by the PI controller and the phase detector. So can we do it better? Indeed, we can. Dr. Steinmeier from the Max Born Institute came up with a very smart and simple idea. The carrier envelope frequency is an air frequency. Air frequencies are used to drive acousto-optical modulators. And what you can see here is the crystal of the op acousto-optical modulator. And when we here connect the radio frequency signal, an uh, <coughs> acoustic wave is generated, symbolized by these black lines. This forms a transient grating. And when the laser beam is coming in, it is diffracted by this grating and comes out with a different angle. The angle and the frequency comp which is coming out are given by energy conservation and momentum conservation, so we have a specific angle. And when we are going for the minus first order, here, then the radio frequency is subtracted from the frequency comp. And if we set that to the carrier envelope offset frequency, this pulse diffracted in the minus first order has no free carrier envelope offset frequency component at all. It is perfectly carrier envelope frequency stabilized. The control scheme for the feed-forward technique looks quite simple. Here at the output, we are measuring the carrier envelope offset frequency. Here at femtolasers, we are doing that with a small little crystal. This is called the zero to F uh, approach. We amplify the carrier envelope offset frequency, apply it to the AOM, Align everything for the first minus first order diffraction and subtract the FCEO from the frequency comp.
That's it. It looks quite fast, right? So it should give us much better results. Indeed, it does. Here you can see on this figure the CE phase jitter results published between 2002 and 2011. On the right side, there is the phase jitter in milliradiant. On the left side, there's the, C, the corresponding CE timing jitter in attoseconds. And the blue dots here, these are results from laser oscillator carrier envelope phase stabilization techniques. Here, standard method, here CEP4. The CEP40 technique gives you an eight times better result. And this corresponds to extremely high temporal resolution of 10 attoseconds. So here, we are at the end of the tutorial. And I have to say goodbye. Thank you.